Welcome back to the final video of the Attention Mechanism series. In this video, I would like to translate everything that we've done before to the Attention is All You Need research paper. And that means that in this video, I'll be talking about the transformer architecture. You can check the show notes for a link, but what I will now first do is copy the schematics from the original paper. We're gonna go over these schematics that are in the paper one by one, but I hope that you already recognize some of the parts that we've discussed in these two. And that's because we have our query key and values here. And the idea is just like before, that I have some sort of collection of word embeddings and every word embedding represents a numeric vector. And this is what feeds the queries, the keys, as well as the values. And you might recognize some of the parts here too. We have our scores just like before, and we have our weights. The paper does list something that's slightly different than what we discussed before though. And that is because this is a scaled dot product attention. And that's because there is a scale step over here. And it's nothing too crazy. What happens in this scaling is we divide by one times the square root of the dimensionality or the size of the word embedding. So that will be the size of this. And this is beneficial for numeric stability for the gradient calculation. But the second thing that's different than what we've talked about is in the paper, they are using this transformer for a translation task. And on the scale that they're using, it makes sense to apply some masking to the tokens, but the paper lists that this is optional. So that means that if we just ignore the masking for now, and I hope that when we look at it this way, that we indeed recognize that, yeah, this is the self-attention mechanism that we discussed in an earlier video. And if we then translate that to multi-headed attention, well, then here we recognize the multiple layers for the queries and the keys and the values. And then we also see that we do the concatenation at the end with a final linear layer. So I hope that at this phase, the scaled dot product and the multi-head attention, hey, that's something that we've seen before. But the diagram that's bound to be really new is this one. Now that diagram, that's the transformer architecture as described in the attention is all you need paper. And if you zoom in, you might recognize that this multi-head attention block that we've got over here, well, this entire block is being used right here. And with this observation out of the way, let's clean up the whiteboard a bit so we can zoom in on this transformer architecture. This is the transformer architecture from the paper. Before going in depth in all the different parts, there's one thing that's good to mention here. And that is that this architecture was used for a translation task. So from English to French and that sort of thing. And you can split up the architecture in an encoder and a decoder. And you could say that this encoder's job is to accept, let's say the English coming in and that this decoder is supposed to then generate the French coming out. But my interest is a little bit less in translation and more in building good digital assistance. So that means that this decoder part is just a little bit less relevant. So that means that I will not zoom in on it. But I hope that you can look at this architecture and recognize, oh yeah, we've got these multi-head attentions and we've got a masked variant of that and there's something coming in from the encoder. But the nice thing about ignoring the decoder is that we don't have to concern ourselves with the output embedding going in here. So let's zoom in on just that encoder part. So this is the transformer encoder block. And there's a few observations that are worth to point out. For starters, just like the multi-head attention block that we have, this encoder block well, you can stack it. When word embeddings go in, contextualized embeddings come out for all of these encoder blocks. And this phenomenon that you can stack them on top of each other, that's represented by this NX that you see over here. The number of these encoders that you stack on top of each other, that is a hyperparameter. 
that is something that you can select and something that you can optimize over. And that's very similar to how you have a hyperparam here for the number of heads. But there are some other parts that are worth discussing too. Another interesting characteristic of this block is that there are junctions. You'll notice that input is coming in here below, and after that it's going to go through this multi-head attention mechanism over here. But there's another junction on the side here, and that means that the input is going through the multi-head attention, and the output of that multi-head attention is combined again with the original input. What comes out over here is normalized, but then a very similar thing happens. Again, we have a numeric vector that's being passed through, in this case, a feed-forward block, but it's also branching off to be combined later. And that is what comes out of this one encoder block here. And you might wonder why this is useful. And to answer that question, let's consider what happens to the gradient signal that comes in. Now imagine the gradient signal coming in here. Then part of that gradient is going to update the weights of this feed-forward layer, and then arrive here. But there's also going to be this update that is unaffected by the feedforward. Now the reason why that is interesting is because numerically there is a risk of vanishing gradients happening if you pass them through many, many layers. And you might think, well, you know, we're just passing it through another add normalization step and there's only one multi-head attention block here. So then you might think, you know, what's the big deal? But then we have to remember we're not going to have just one of these blocks. We're going to have many. So this addition and normalization step in between, that will have numeric benefits. I hope at this phase you recognize that the main thing that's in this architecture is this multi-head attention mechanism. The other parts aren't that special. But the nice thing about this multi-head attention is that this is a mechanism to add context one that's not based on recurrent neural networks, but on an architecture that's more parallelizable. There is one potential caveat, though. And that is the fact that the attention really doesn't care about the order. And part of this is a good thing. You want context to be able to travel from the beginning of the sentence to the end of it, and vice versa. But there is something to be said that maybe we need to push the algorithm a little bit, such that position does have meaning. And that's where this positional encoding comes in. It's a step that's been added to push the encoder to care more about position. So the idea behind the positional encoding, let's say that I've got this vector i over here, and that's the vector that I'm going to pass through this network, and that's the vector that's about to be enhanced by a positional encoding, then, then this vector is just this array of numbers, that's the word embedding, well, then what's going to happen is we're going to focus in on this index i, because that tells me, hey, that's the first, second, or third word embedding in the series that I'm currently considering. And that also means that I can fetch a positional encoding for that same index. And I'll just draw that green. That'll just be a numeric representation. And, and, and these are just numbers, right? So you can imagine that there's a low number here, uh, another small number here, maybe some some larger numbers here, but, but what's happening is these two get added together, and this is going to give me my word embedding once again, but with values added that represent an encoding, if you will, of position. And I guess I can draw that as V, I, and I'll put a little star there to indicate that it's a little bit better. But it's just the addition operation that's happening there. What's, I suppose, a little bit more interesting is how do you go about just generating these positional vectors? And this is not going to just happen for vector i. This is going to happen for every single vector. So if I were to say I've got vector j here, then I'll also have a positional index that's related. And, and this will be a different vector. But the goal is to have these positional embeddings that represent position in the utterance. And we're just adding that, and we're doing that for all the inputs that we have. So then the correct question would be, how do you go about finding these encodings? Because you're going to need to have vectors. How do you go about creating them such that the information of where the vector is is properly encoded? And there's a few things that you could do. 
For starters, we could say, hey, let's learn this. After all, there is some gradient information that's coming back out here, and we could pass that along to maybe train this positional embedding over here. That's one thing that you can do. And another thing that you can do is you can come up with some sort of principled approach where you say, well, I've got a function that accepts the index of the input and it accepts the total number of vectors that I have. And then I come up with a function that has mathematical properties that I like, and I'll just put that in there. That's another thing that you could do. But how you go exactly about this is a little bit of a detail. The main thing that's important is that you recognize that there's a hyperparameter for this. And it's something that we can tune. So there you have it. This is the transformer encoder block that we use a lot in natural language processing these days. In particular, at Raza, we use this a lot for our diet architecture. In fact, it's one of the main components. And we also make use for it in our TED policy algorithm. But I hope the main thing that the transformer brings to the table is the block that you see in there, the multi-head attention. Instead of using recurrent neural networks to add context to word vectors, we now are using a different mechanism. And since it's that mechanism that is the main part that drives this transformer, I figured it'd be a nice way to wrap up this series of videos by highlighting why multi-head attention offers something that recurrent neural networks just don't. I have made two drawings of two mechanisms. The mechanism on the left represents a recurrent structure. Each node represents a hidden state, and the links represent weights that connect nodes together. The drawing on the right represents the multi-head attention mechanism found in the transformer. And note that there are multiple heads of attention drawn here. In this case, three. So let's discuss some key differences between the two. If I want to know the value that comes out of here, out of this node, then I would need to know the value of the neighbors. And this would propagate. And what I hope that you can imagine is that because I need to know the neighbors, training this in parallel is going to be hard. Because in order to calculate this value, I need to calculate all the values before. So the opportunity for parallelism is small there. Whereas here, because I have these multiple attention heads, there is an opportunity for me to train those in parallel. Let's now also consider what effect this might have on the gradient signal. Because eventually, there's going to be some signal coming in here that wants to do updates. And you can imagine the signal coming in here it is going to update this arc, and it's going to update this arc. But every time that it updates an arc, the signal will decrease. And you can imagine that this is a downside. If there's information at the beginning of the sentence that has to make it all the way back to the end, then you're going to need a whole lot of data in the recurrent setting to be able to learn that pattern. We have this vanishing gradient that's going to bite us. Now, if we compare that to the multi-head attention, then yes, we get our gradient signal and there's this concatenation and linear layer first, but immediately after, there's gonna be a strong signal going into all of these heads. And from here on, there's the self-attention mechanism. So for the keys, the values, and the queries, we are going to make one single update, but you only need to update these three layers to get attention, potentially, from all the way to the back to all the way in the beginning. This multi-head attention system is more flat in the sense that it's easier for us not to focus on the nearest neighbors, but to quickly focus our attention to word embeddings that are far apart. And that is something that can be quite powerful in natural language processing. I hope you've enjoyed this series of videos.